is uh, all you know is my name, perhaps. Uh, so I'm in my background is uh, I worked as a professional software engineer for quite a few years, uh, and I work uh, actually in Scala. So that's one of the languages that have a fairly rich type system, uh, yet it. Um, it's somewhat different from what we talk about when we talk about types uh, in the few seminars I've been here. So, uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, maybe I'll just uh, briefly go into Scala here. So this this is like a Scala IDE, and um, I think the main notion of types that we use as professional software engineers, uh, maybe we is in the past sense, is uh, you have some kind of data, uh, and you give it a type. So in this case, I have uh, some A, and we give it one, two, three, and that that might not seem so interesting. Uh, but really, the a kind of the the key observation thing that we make is like we compose types, we make other types. So we have bags of data. So maybe we'll have a, a student type, uh, and then this will have a name, and then say a major. So maybe have a major. Cool. Um, and then uh, for us, like it's very data centric. So we're thinking a lot about like. Okay, well now I have a student, so I can have a list of students. Right, so maybe we'll say this is student. Uh, student Chris. Uh, and, and kind of the, the thing here that we see is like a lot of this is very data forward, data centric. So the stuff we talked about types uh, from last time, uh, I'll just try to remember what we talked about. So we talked about how. Uh, these things called sets in this notes is really uh, Martin Lapo actually say, oh, by the way, they're just types. I think that comes in like page 12 ish. Uh, but we talked about how they correspond to propositions, uh, unlike, say, propositions in classical logic, which has some kind of truth or false value. They're more like, uh, yeah, they're, they're more like where uh, you, you, have, you need a proof of it. So you need some way of uh, inhabiting that proposition. And uh, you know, that, that's something like maybe if I stare at a data type, I have a proof of a data type when I, when I construct it, right? So uh, say my student type uh, is this thing, and uh, this is inhabiting that student type. So uh, if I have you know, name, major, or whatever, uh, you, know, you can think of this as like S is in, um, S is in capital S. Uh, so today, uh, we're not going to be as data focused as what we see in Scala today because we're going to be trying uh, this fancy dancy thing called Pi, which is a dependently typed programming language that I think mixes a mixture of this kind of data centric focus that you see a lot from these industrial languages with these kind of research ideas about like types as propositions. So that, that was something that I think is uh, something that is in the notes. So, uh, yeah, so my take on this is like we're going to be looking at um, some of these stuff we see on page seven. Um, so that's like this. Uh, logical operations we see, and then tra translating them to what we see in, in this Pi language, uh, and hopefully, um, hopefully making some sense of it. So in some ways, we're like working backwards from a finished product. Uh, so the thing that I found with Pi is like it seems very close to Martin uh, uh like kind of type theory, and that it has, uh, you know, we talk about the four forms of judgment. It has, it has that. We'll see that shortly. Um, and then it has like very various uh, things that we talked about from last time. So, you know, just to get started, uh, it has this idea of a natural number. So, you know, if I just literally type the letter nat uh, and I press this run button, which is ginormous run button, actually tiny run button. <laughs> uh, it was ginormous on my previous computer, uh, but it, it gives me this uh, output that says uh, I have the u nat, uh, and the u uh, corresponds to this idea of a universe. So I know we briefly touched on this like a few sessions ago about how like there's like the type of all types problem. Um, they just, I don't know if they brush it outside, but they say U is just the type of all types that don't need to refer to it, something to that, to that effect. Uh, but really, like, the thing about working backwards is like we're coming from a conclusion. We're coming from like, oh, we have the natural numbers. Uh, and what can we do with it? Well, uh, you know, we have stuff like this, right? We can just literally type in zero, and we have something that's inhabited. Uh, we can type in this. I don't know. Uh, you know. This is one of those scheme variants that require you to parenthesize a lot of things. Uh, and one thing I noticed, like with programming languages, uh, there's a lot of these really nice uh, go tips. So you can kind of like I'll, I'll be probably going through the talks. I'll be fumbling my way through some stuff and just staring at the tooltip and 
saying, like, what is that saying to us? Uh, so in this case, the tooltip says uh, this is some function uh, that returns a natural number. Uh, so I just stare at this. Good. So I get I get plus one. Uh, okay, great. So now we're going to go through um, some of the kind of close associations of this language with the judgments that we saw. So uh, one one type of judgment, uh, I refer to my notes, or you know, print it off. There's like four types of judgments, right? So uh, the judgment uh, A is a set. Uh, if we translate the word set to type, A is a type is kind of like pre-baked into a lot of the types that uh, exist in this language. So nat is a type. Uh, another type that we'll see is called atom. I'll go zoom in a little bit more. Um, atom is like uh, a type of symbol, so it's like kind of strings. Like you can have, uh, you can have like at anything that's like, you know, like something that opens with a tick mark is called an atom in this world. Um, great. Uh, the second one is when um, a and B are equal sets. Uh, so here, uh, this is where Pi provides an implementation for us. For us. So it has this thing called check same. Uh, and uh, this is where it's like, okay, we have some kind of judgment that says A and B are equal. Uh, well, what do we need? Uh, so I think Martin Law, I think we, we went through this last time. It was something, something like, uh, you have to know that uh, A and B are sets for this comparison to make some sense. So that's why in this little tooltip thing, you have uh, an extra argument of type. So I'll put the type U, uh, and then I can see that uh, if I plug in nat nat, everything's all happy. So this is a this is like an example of a judgment that the system is. Uh, I don't know what the right terminology is like providing us. It's asserting because uh, like if I suppose I type something else, it'll complain. It'll complain that they're not the same U. Um, I'm actually not quite sure what the terminology is because maybe it's trying to interpret and it's complaining that it's an invalid. So it's type checking would be the name of the general thing. This is a type checker more than it is a compiler. Mm -hmm. But you could say that it's judged it to be false it's or true in this case. Okay. Great. Uh, and that's like the second type of judgment uh, of the fourth form. And then there's like this third form, um, something of little a is an element of the set a. So uh, for some reason, they like to use natural grammar here, so it's like uh, something like using the letter the. You can assert, uh, you can judge that something is of uh, this type. So in this case, v nat three says three is a natural number, and if I use something that I know is not a natural number, uh, similarly the judgment uh, is asserted to be false. Okay. Um, lastly, there's like this. Uh, we can compare numbers, or we can what was it? we can compare a and b are equal elements of the set. A. If I just plug in stuff, it wasn't like that. Um, oops, oops, sorry. Use check checks, checks in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so these are all like baked into the language, um, and this is like in contrast with something that uh, when we just read through the docs, uh, they have like this. I don't know. Sorry. Okay, that is way too bright. I'm gonna not do that. Uh, so I, I would just refer to uh, what I prepared a little bit, which is like this idea of a propositional equality. Um, that's actually also a first-class citizen in this language. Uh, so what I mean by that, well, uh, you can you can define types uh, that are propositions of equality. So so here's an example. Uh, so this is, I'm not sure this came, came up in the notes, and I was actually reading this, and I was like, okay, I can clearly like make some data that fits this shape. Uh, but I don't really have a good understanding of like why this is the case. So like you know I could I could I can actually inhabit this type by um, by doing this uh, uh, you know somewhat nonsensical looking statement that says uh, define same nat as this thing called same three, where same is just saying okay <laughs> three is the same as three. Uh, yet it type checks this statement. So I think this is going to be later part later on in the notes. Um, just briefly scanning through, it talks about some kind of capital letter I for I forgot what the abbreviation was, but identity it, type. Identity type, yeah. And it had like three parameters, which is precisely these three parameters we see here. Uh, so this is, I thought this was interesting just because like, if we just stare at this language, uh, we have access to like a lot of the hidden features, um, yet we may not know much, like I certainly don't know much about this. As of now, I think it, it's useful to like, maybe convert the hiographs, uh, or whatever the, the symbols in the picture, or in, in, the, um, in the paper into something that Maybe can execute. Uh, maybe can give us a little bit of sense. So uh, that's something that I'm going to try to do. Uh, maybe I'll we'll 
I'll, maybe I'll publish something like on this on GitHub so we can have kind of a running tally of examples as we go through talks throughout the weeks. Um, that's something if you're interested in. This is a free language, and there's also a good companion book that teaches how to use it. It's called The Little Typer. So if you do wish to dabble, this is all accessible. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, you have to download a program. I can help folks set up if you're curious. Um, I think for me, like, some of the motivation here is, like, having this running tally of examples that both refer to data. So, like, in this case, like, NAT3 is just some, some piece of data. Uh, and then th they have, like, list types and other pieces of data construction, as well as uh, ways to think about propositions or uh, types that are more about, like, uh, algorithms. Or um, I think the, one of the words that they use is, like, so like there was like four interpretations. One of them was a problem or a specification. Where um, I think this language kind of blends the interpretation of types of data, which is something that is supernatural to us. Like maybe in my humble opinion, it's supernatural. Maybe it's like it's not for everybody. But uh, and the type is uh, specification, which is a bit more vague. So like to me, it's like okay, if you have a type that says uh, this is a sorted list, like that, or like a type that says like this is an even number, that feels a bit harder to grasp, um, despite it being represented in the same language with like the same systems. You'll notice this, unlike, say, if you've ever programmed something in Sage or some other math software, there's no help other than going to some website and finding somebody to help you. But here, just by hovering your mouse over some piece of this, it pops up something to tell you a little bit of what's going on. So it's a good way to learn. If you ever really do want to learn to program something, Racket is a pretty good little first, first pass at learning some programming. Yeah. Yeah, cool, thanks. Uh, so next, uh, we're going to just go a bit over page, through page seven, which is like these logical operations. That's where we ended up last time. We talked about like um, if you're given uh, a, if you're given some um, types, how do you like form new types out of thin air using operations, which are things that apply, uh, are kind of binary operators. I think that's what most of these are. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, and, and the interpretation for us last time was like, okay, these are proofs of propositions. So like this A and B thing is like we need a proof of A um, and a proof of B. Uh, so in this case, uh, you know, th those are, I think I read them somewhere. It's like you, you're able to create these compound propositions from these component propositions. But uh, my, my own, when I thought about this, it was more it's like, it's really like a language for composition, which is like useful everywhere. Uh, so like when I thought about data, I'm like, okay, well, like 90% of my job in my old job was like literally pushing data around. Like where uh, our mantra was like, we want really dumb data, and we want kind of smart algorithms. Uh, we want to be able to understand what, what what we're executing on our data types. But if we have data that does too much things, does too many, um, has too much internal state, then it becomes really confusing. But uh, this kind of core idea of composition, I think, uh, maps pretty well to. And that's pretty well to this uh, to this language. So, wanted to go through uh, some of those things. And like I mentioned, because this language is in some ways a finished product, uh, all these things already exist. So it's really like I'm, we're trying to interpret what it's actually doing. So, okay, great. So, uh, first things first, uh, it has this false type, uh, just called absurd, uh, which is pretty hilarious. Uh, and and uh, well, the, this type, uh, if we just read through the table, it says it consists of uh, nothing. There's no proof for it. Uh, so there's no way, there should be no way to have this type. Uh, and uh, if I stare at the notes, oh, God, this is so bright. I'm really sorry for anybody whose eyes are burned. Um, there's something called in uh, absurd that um, I'd be very curious to get into a bit more later. Um, so it's a lot of times in Pi, everything's talking about induction. Um, everything's talking about like how do you take a, sh I guess take a type and then break it down to component pieces. Maybe that's my current interpretation, but I know in the notes they talk a little bit more about induction with natural numbers and uh, induction as elimination. I think that was like the big big part there. So we'll have to hopefully make sense of that a bit later because right now um, I frankly don't understand much of that. So one of the things that you can't do with an empty set is put something in it. But suppose you want to use the empty set to make an implication. You want to end with an implication or you want to start with an implication that has an empty set. Mm -hmm. So you have to hypothesize something in it. It's going to lead to an absurd, right? Mm -hmm. But this end absurd is saying I want to have that to be able to make Theorems that either end, like proof of a false, mm -hmm. I want to end with absurdity, I have to be able to talk about the data inside of this empty set. So this end absurd is a way to make that something you can write in a program, even though it will never be called, because it can't exist. 
it's like a lambda with absurd as a parameter. Exactly. Yet, yet you can never call it. Just you can it, still write that. You, yeah. stuff. you can write the question of does the empty set map to something, and there's always the function from the empty set to nothing. Right. But I guess you never could test it was false. Right. And I guess in that sense, you can also write something like this, which is a proposition of two equals one, um, and my, you know, my uh, programming language software will say I created a type. Um, and maybe this is also the absurd type, but maybe it's just like a naming constant thing. Like you yeah, it's not really the absurd type. It will turn out to be equivalent. It'll be, equivalent. It'll be functions between the two empty sets, right? But on, in type theory, things don't get to be equal until you have a reason to say they're equal. So here, they're both existing as unproven claims. In fact, both unprovable. But you don't have that they're equal. They really are different types until you make some functions between them. And this is where we get eventually into homotopy type theory, because you want to keep track of the ways that you would make equivalences between things that ought to be the same, but that aren't technically the same yet. So you have maps that are higher order and higher order and higher order. Right. And, and these, we'll see infinity categories are the way to write that down. So like these in some way ought to be the same? They ought to be the same because they have no proofs, of, and, and so in some sense, they, neither one of them has a proof. But they're clearly different types of data. If they were to be true, there'd be diff different reasons they were true. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're both false is kind of an oddity of these examples, not because they're actually intrinsically the same. So anything you would say to relate the two is something you've observed after the fact, creating the types. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Does anybody else have questions or want to see an experiment or anything? Experiment? Uh, you know, it doesn't have to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down to experiment. Is this going by too fast, too slow? You can also interject and say, could you show me another one you've done before? If, it, if you wanted to understand it better. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Sorry Chris, I didn't mean to stop you. Just sometimes people don't know when to speak up. No, it's okay. Um, I also want to be cognizant of time. So, so I guess the other uh, big thing that we can do in this language is uh, Martin Love calls this his type theory an open system. So in the in pi, we can create new types. Uh, so uh, you know, given that we only have a few types to work with, uh, I will create a type. Uh, so, the, so this claim word, uh, I think this corresponds to this uh, formation out, out of the type construction, what was it, the, the four rules of type construction? Yes, yeah. so I'm jumping around uh, the notes a little bit, but this is that whole thing about like starting from the finish line. It's like, okay, well, we're, we're typing letters that does something, and clearly it has to correspond to some rules that uh, Martin Loft laid out in the papers. Um, so claim is like uh, Pi's way of separating formation with introduction, because uh, the introduction rule is, uh, uh, so when I define this thing, so uh, maybe one motivation is like I can claim something, uh, you know, at the start, and then I do some other stuff, and then I can define this later. But in this case, when I define, um, I can just define my nat to be a natural number, uh, and this creates a new type. So that's uh, that's the language in Pi for this. Okay. Uh, and then I guess one thing we could do is Sandy check this. Um, I think there's a rule that says this has to be the same. Um, I don't, maybe just a substitution rule or reduction rule. But, uh, oops, sorry, you here. Oh, this. Oh, no. So this this will pass. Um, and clearly, if I write Adam, this will not pass. Yeah, when we see identity types, we'll see that you, what you're doing here is you're doing something where before it actually knows to compare nat and my nat, it says, what do I know about my nat? Well, my nat was defined as nat, and it'll actually substitute my nat with nat, and then compare is nat equal to nat, and it says, yes, that's an axiom. Everything's equal to itself. Yeah, so maybe that's the substitution rule we see in like page nine or something. Because, yeah, whenever I see this, I'm always like, what, what rule is this coming from? <laughs> like, they're not pulling stuff out of thin air, right? They have to have some, some kind of foundation. So. That's yeah. always the thing that's we like, talked at one point about like lists of one plus five. Like you have a list of five vectors, and then I said, well, maybe five was written as two plus three. Should it really be a different data type? And the answer was, I can't see a, re a single reason I would ever want two plus three to be different from five. So what I mean there is, whenever I see a plus, I first evaluate it to a canonical answer like five, and now I compare the two at that canonical level. And that's what's happened here. My nat isn't canonical. It looks up what it is canonically. Oh, it's nat. Then it judges whether nat is the same as nat. Great. Um, and yeah, with this uh, formation that we just described, we can uh, start with this a and b. So proof of a and proof of b uh, in data land thinks about 
uh, it, it's like a pair of pieces of data. So uh, in fact, they, they use the word pair here, which is uh, pretty nice. So I'm going to uh, make my type called breakfast fruits, and I will uh, define this. So the thing with the formation is always like we're just defining the type that it ought to be. And the introduction where um, we're using a uh, very suggestively named cons. Uh, it's, called a con uh, it's called cons. I think they say it's a type constructor. Mm -hmm. uh, and good. Yeah, so what we've done is we've uh, created this pair of uh, atoms, apple and banana. And uh, you might imagine, I think we talked about this, about uh, being able to take the first and second, or being able to take the uh, yeah, the first pair, element from the pair and the second. So uh, this is like legacy computer science notation, car. Uh, so this will give us the first, right, this atom apple. Um, and I think uh, there's this equality rule that is something like um, if I get the first thing here, this should be equal to um, this thing. I think that's um, if we stared at the definition of I think if we say a definition of, um, and there's like there's like this equality rule, and then this one here is like the elimination rule, where we're able to take something that's constructed together and uh, deconstruct it. So often, in, uh, it's also called pat pattern matching in some ways. Like we're talking about, okay, we have potential many different pieces of data. Which one are we looking at here? So in in last bit, when by is fast, instead of car, you could say left and right. right. It's just trying to tell you which of the two in the pair are you looking. Yeah, and this stuff, I think all, um, you know, we feel it's like intuitive and natural and whatnot, but I think it actually all came from some rules uh, outlined in this page. So it's, it's like really interesting to think about, like, okay, where, where the heck does this come from? Because, uh, like, the notes here have, like, really two main parts. One is, like, uh, the product stuff. Uh, so, Cartesian, so, like, it uses the, 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 pro, the pi tuff, the pi symbol, and uh, talks about, like, uh, if I have a type A, uh, and for every little a in A, I have some type B of A. Um, so I think that's, like, we call that the universal quantifier here, but uh, it's maybe that generalizes a bit to, to some other spaces. And then there's like a uh, disjoint union part. So like, the, I feel like somewhere in those two rules uh, is where this is coming from. Uh, and in fact, I think yeah, the first versions of this were in a program called Neutral, which came out of a group at Cornell, a guy called Constable, and he was trying to make a version of Martin Lott's type theory that he was in this book. So he he proved it could actually be computed. And all these systems have taken the lessons from that. Yeah, and I think a pair, if I remember, was um, is a special case of uh, a product mm -hmm. or a sigma. Sorry, it's a special case of sigma. Uh, no, nope. it would be a product type. The pi type. No pi type. Okay. Um, yes, these are things uh, I think we'll have to. We'll, we'll get to them. Yeah, as we do slowly digest. Because uh, the other thing was the, the either type, which I was having a really hard time finding where. That came from um, with the rules in here, but the plus usually the plus. Okay, yeah, and uh, but I just want to show what that would look like. So um, instead of saying I have breakfast fruits, so I have both apples and bananas, I might uh, I might just have a coffee or or a bagel. So that's um, that looks something like this. I'm uh, I'm introducing this type, and then now I'm. But gonna, just for clarity, the, not introducing the type so much as you're forming a type, so now you're giving its introduction. Oh, that's right, yeah, formation, yeah. Um, and the language itself has uh, these things already built in, uh, so you can kind of uh, take, you know, say, uh, what was it, row three and page seven and you know, translate it to uh, these various constructors that you can use. Uh, and yeah, so once we define this, uh, there's something that I think we might get to a bit later. Uh, but how do you like get the stuff out of it? You have to use this pretty hard to use. Oh my god. <laughs> oh geez. Uh, so so maybe this will come up in somewhere in the notes in some giant blob of notation. But uh, this idea of elimination, which is to say, given an either type, I want to um, I want to compute something with it. It's it's like a pretty tricky concept because you, you need first an idea of well I'm given some either type. That's that's called a target. Um, in this world, they use this. Uh, Convention consistently called a motive, which is like given some input data, what's your output type? And that's like super hard to wrap my mind around because that's like you're given data, but you're outputting a type. 
Anyways, that, that's just something that, um, you know, I have some kind of dumb examples where I'm ignoring the data. I'm saying my output type is always going to be an atom, say, but this, this thing seems like extremely general. Uh, Does anybody in this room who saw stuff with us last semester see what this is? What elimination rule we have hiding here in a bunch of notation? Elimination rule or what's happening? Yeah, which maybe maybe if you were thinking of a with your category theory hat on, <laughs> what commuter diagram would you draw? Take a few guess for the category theory side, but I don't know if I can defend one here. So I was hearing Tatum say one, and, and then I'll come to Michael. Go ahead, Tatum. Um, well, I think it seems like a co product because you have um, on left then you have some thing in your X that includes into this either or on right you have some you thing want to over here. Yeah. I'm going to try to be dynamic in this. Look at this. Look at this, everybody. We are high tech now. I can bring some of my into the uh, Oh, there's <laughs> <laughs> um, It's okay. Yeah, what I see either X, Y. That's what I'm thinking. Um, Motive, I'm not so sure. Maybe that means we want our x, y to be in our same category, maybe. Uh, motive, I don't quite understand. But on left, we could view that as having, we have some iota x that gives us something in our left either. And some y that gives us something in our right either. So my intuition was saying. Okay, so motive is leaving our either. If you look at where it's at, mm. motive is leaving our either, which is that Cartesian uh. pro or uh, co-product. And what would you need in a category theory context to express the co-product would be a function leaving it, provided you already had. And do we see those? Yep. Yep. So it is incredibly complicated to see it written as the blue text. But if you're a mathematician and you've done a little bit of exposure to co-products and, and some categorical pictures, then it's less scary. And that's actually what I give you as a hint for doing anything like programming this stuff, is to have a piece of scratch paper or whiteboard behind you where you draw what's going on as a category. And then you approach the code and you make this expression up. Because nobody, I don't think anybody, is born seeing that expression and saying, oh, I know what to do. I mean, you have to think through where did this come from. It came from the concept of or, and or gives us co-products. Uh, and I want to be uh, conscientious of time. I know um, Sean. Yeah, we'll, we'll transition to Sean. Yeah. We've also had a tradition in this uh, seminar to bubble over. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, I mean, I can. I was thinking of like this could be like a running thing going in the future as well. Oh yeah, so, I, I, I mean, I yeah. certainly give you the feedback that this was helpful. Great. Uh, so Sean, do you want to go on, or like I don't know what we. What, why don't we, we pause if you're yeah. at a good stopping spot, and let's see what Sean's going to bring. I think he's going to do it on the board. Is that correct? Yeah. But we will keep cycling back through because yeah. sometimes doing is more believable than just being told. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, you know maybe my conclusion on this was like uh, I think a lot of these data interpretations or this. Uh, on page seven, the A and B, A or B, A implies B, those have like really clean interpretations uh, in terms of the data. Uh, the dependent types, I think, are really best interpreted in terms of propositions or um, like a specification. I, I feel, feel like with data, it's a little bit harder to interpret. Maybe that's my own bias. So we'll, we'll look back to that <laughs> another time. Cool. Thank you, Chris. Yep. OK, let's uh, switch modes. It's the same simple example as a springboard for a few different thoughts, so hopefully it doesn't become too labored. Um, so first, I want to throw up on the boards a little tiny bit of pseudocode, if I can open this. Could I help you to write slightly bigger? Yes.
Okay. So this is, by all appearances, a pretty short, pretty simple looking piece of code. Um, but without any context, without any explanation on my part, um, it's probably unclear to most or all of you what exactly is going on here, what my intended use of this is. And um, as you can imagine, that problem would only get worse uh, as code gets, uh, as programs get longer or more complicated, you start using different languages, different methods are implemented. Um, so, for example, uh, sorting algorithms. Um, you know, maybe you know how to sort, uh, sort, but when you actually sit down to construct the sort, all of a sudden, you know, there's all these choices that you can make. There are, you know, chapters and books about it. And uh, maybe you and I were not making the same decisions. And so even though we're trying to achieve roughly the same thing, we might not understand what the other person is really doing. Um, so what we need is some way to document. We need one. Maybe a better pen. <laughs> Not that one. So we need to do a way to document the intended purpose of a function, or uh, sorry, of a program. And two, we need to be able to do this in a way that's independent of our choice of construction of the program. And so it turns out that one method of documentation that we could choose is intuition of state type theory. Um, now, at the risk of undermining my authority up here, I guess, um, I'm not, I don't have a strong background in programming. Um, so I've never done this. I'm taking the word of James <laughs> and the, the internet. Um, there's a, literally in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, they have an entry that is claiming that because um, type systems are so rich and robust, um, types can be used to describe almost any conceivable property of a program, which makes them ideal for as specifications of, um, of the, the purpose of a program. Um, so, with that in mind, if I backtrack here for a minute and I go back to the pseudo code, if I can take a marker that works, if I go through and I just amend this slightly, This new choice of notation might make it less ambiguous for some people what's going on now. Um, but I don't think we could claim that it's totally unambiguous. Uh, so if instead I came in and now I threw this up on the board, which is easier said than 
So for nm in the natural numbers, and here I'm assuming that 0 is a natural number, n greater than 0, there exists q and r in the natural numbers such that m equals q times m plus r, r less than n. So this is just standard division algorithm for the natural numbers. And uh, at this point, if I claimed that this little pseudocode met the specifications for this theorem, then I think all, all of a sudden we would all know exactly what's going on. We plug in uh, a pair of natural numbers, M and N, and it gives us as an output a pair uh, Q and R corresponding to M and N uh, via the theorem. Um, so if I actually take this now one step farther, Uh, I'm going to claim that this is correct um, just for the sake of brevity. Uh, if I wanted to now take this theorem and express it using types, I would end up with Sounds ready. The thing he's trying to emphasize, and I just want to make sure it, it lands with you all, there's a program over there which, if you ran it on inputs M and N, would have done the division, would have produced the quotient and the remainder. And you would have been perhaps pretty proud of yourself if you guessed that looking at the code. But even if you did guess it, another program would come along and you couldn't guess what it does by just looking at the code. Over here is a purely mathematical statement. And so we're looking for a bridge between these two extremes of something that can just output an answer that you don't really understand why, and something that's so pedantic that only mathematicians bother to write it this way. Right, so we're trying to get that level of clarity all the way out to a program that actually does something you want to do, like divide. OK, yeah, so um, there's actually a lot going on here that I'm just going to hand away that uh, for the sake of brevity. Um, I'm going to assume like we've constructed the natural numbers. We understand how addition and multiplication and even um, equality work. Um, I do want to touch on the quantifiers in a second, uh, but I wanted to emphasize that this here is telling us in, in the same way that a proposition is defined by the criteria that you would use to determine what constitutes a proof of that proposition. And that sort of same thing, this is telling us how to construct programs of this type, how to construct programs that satisfy the specifications of this theorem. Um, so, like I said, I, I want to I want to gloss over some of this and just focus on um, these for a minute. I think Chris was kind of hitting on it at one point. These uh, quantifiers, um, if I'm understanding correctly, simply type lambda calculus was extended in a way similarly to how predicate logic was extended to propositional logic by the introduction of quantifiers. Um, here, uh, 
uh, simply typed lambda calculus was extended uh, using the introduction of um, dependent types, sorry, uh, which is what these turn out to be. Um, I, when I first actually saw these products and, and some notation, I was a bit confused, so I do wanna maybe develop a tiny bit of in intuition for why they're being used. Um, because we've seen before that uh, the Cartesian product, the standard Cartesian product, and conjunction, there's a natural relation there. Um, I think in the notes, Slothner even has something like um, Something like that, uh, but the idea is that if we've got this pair and they're in the product of A and B, what we're saying is that little a is in big A and little b is in big B. And this is still true if instead of a and B, we decide to use subscript uh, indices. <laughs> so this is just as true for you know a a one cross a two with little a one and little a two. But what's going on with the universal quantifier, the for all? Uh, because the universal quantifier, we're saying, you know, for all x, px, whatever p is, the proposition p is true. <clears throat> What's happening here is that if we now have this long product of a1 through an, then we've got this long list of conjunctions like this, which is really the same as saying that for all i greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to n, that AI, little ai is in big ai. Uh, so that's roughly the intuition of why this product is, is capturing the, the for all, the universal quantifier. And similarly, if we look at the existential quantifier, um, we, we've again seen before that there's just the natural correspondence between um, disjoint union and disjunction. Um, Sometimes shorthand for disjoint union would be the A plus B also looks like that. And again, I think Lochner has something like that. But now what we're saying is if X is in the disjoint union of a and B, then it's in A or it's in B. And if we play a similar game to over here, we 
we could end up with x in this string of disjoint unions, which is just a st string of disjunctions. This is the same as saying that there exists an i greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to n with x and ai. This is true, everybody. This part is really critical because it's how we're going to translate the math, which has things like for all and exists, into just type constructors. Pi is for the product. <laughs> Sigma for the sum done many times. I like to use square cup or something instead of a plus when I'm doing disjoint unions of sets because I'm an algebraic, so plus means something to me. However, it's just the nature of type theory that it uses sum. And there's a little sort of silly English language trick here. If I was to read sum q n such that it almost sounds like there exists. Right? It's a different spelling. It's not S-U-M, it's S-O-M, but you say it's some and it sounds the same. So it's not going to change is the point. But it's really a disjoint union. It's not addition. It's also careful. It's not a coproduct in general categories, right? You could have vector spaces that you sum together and that's not a coproduct. Right? So this sum here, or this disjoint union, is specific to say what you would do in set theory as a coproduct. But you could have coproducts somewhere else, in groups, for example that are much more complicated. So don't make the association that product and coproduct are always for all and exist. It's when in the context of sets that they become a for all and exist. When you move those to other categories, they become different things. And so you get different logic for it. For example, if you have a monoidal category, then you get what's called linear logic out of that. So like, to be thinking that there's a logic attached to this kind of decomposition, but its meaning could be quite different if you change the category that's your target category. Sean, I'm going to suggest that we pause here. Okay. Why don't you just at least write where the pi, pi, sigma, sigma is, for all, for all, exists, exists, so that it shows up once on the camera. And then we'll pick up next time with what's happening with the equal sign. And I've already got a volunteer, Mehdi's volunteered, to discuss that, I think. So we'll see um, if that's the right place to go. And I'll talk with Sean about whether he had more stuff that he wanted to present. Are there any questions before we call it a night? I think the dependent part of this is R less than n. What's going on here is uh, these um, the universal quantifiers are going to be what, what are called uh, dependent functions. And then I believe the existential quantifiers are going to be what are called dependent pairs. And those are examples of dependent types. Um, and basically, a dependent function is going to be one where the type depends on the argument. And a dependent pair is literally, it's the, the second term, its type depends on the first term. I mean, I'm oversimplifying this, but. I believe that's... So the miracle that's happening in the black ink is that this is just a type. We don't know that there are any data of this type. But even the little equal sign is a data type. It's not a claim of true or false. It's just a data type. It might even be empty. So what's happening is this is a claim. It's a proposition. But we don't know of a proof of it yet. Data of this type will therefore give us a proof of this theorem. The data of this type will actually be a dependent function, meaning it'll be what def div mn over here on the blue. That, if we put all the type annotations and document what everything is, is actually a piece of data of this type because it takes in an arbitrary m and an arbitrary n and it returns something with a q and an r that satisfies m equals qn plus r. And if you write that algorithm out, it's actually the algorithm is the proof the type of the function 
is the claim of the algorithm. So when you think of an algorithm, we think of like defining a function like def gcd, right? But if you're very careful, the gcd is a claim that given two integers, there's always a pair of integers s and t such that the linear combination is the greatest common divisor. And if you write that really gory expression down, then that's just a claim. It could be true or false. And the GCD algorithm is the proof of it. And that's the Curry-Howard isomorphism theorem in work. It's saying that everything that you prove is actually an algorithm. And every algorithm is actually a proof of some claim. If you write things sufficiently uh, precisely, at least. It's not true if you just sort of give generic waving hands proofs. But, but it certainly is if you're very precise, you can make a translation between the two of them. And now we're just finding the path through it. But don't lose track of the fact that this is not a piece of data yet. This is just a data type. So the dependent part will be that once I have data of that type, that function will be dependent. Its output will depend on the inputs. All right, let's call it a night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>